uh, thinking about this morning and the theme of God as someone who makes promises, someone who keeps promises, someone who has promises that are still out there that we have yet to, to receive. Uh, I, I think about one of my favorite stories, and some of you have heard it multiple times at this point, uh, but when we used to be next door neighbors, corner neighbors with Dan and Penny, um, we would walk sometimes, uh, Becca and I, or Jane and Becca and I, uh, to a park that was not exactly close. Uh, it was the closest park and walking distance was kind of Junction Avenue Middle School. So we would walk there. And uh, Becca and I, uh, one day I said, do you wanna go to the park today? And she said, yes. And I said, great, let's go. And so we walked down the block. We make it a, a whole block, turn the corner, and walk, I don't know, 10 yards. And she sees a, a wheelchair ramp that is silver and metal, and that's it. And she's like, park and she runs up and down it and she like hangs on the on the bar and she's like swinging and she is having as much fun as you have seen her have at various times in her life like she loves it it's it's a ramp <laughs> and there's a park in the future and and this story reminds me right how often we are walking with someone who has made us a promise and that someone is taking us somewhere. But we see something that looks promise-like. It looks sort of fun, looks engaging, looks entertaining, looks whatever it looks, but is less than all that the promise maker has for us. And, and this story is so fun because it, it just captures our walk with God so often, doesn't it? That God has offered us these promises and says, walk with me, draw near to me in my presence. I will take you to this place. I will take you, as in our passage this morning, I will take you to the rest that you were made for, the rest that your heart longs for. But how quickly the Israelites lose sight of the God who dwells in their midst. How quickly they lose sight of the God who is with them, who is leading them to a place and instead settle for far less, get distracted by far less, enjoy it momentarily. I, I love I love that story, and Becca likes when I tell it, tell it too. Um, I, I asked her if I could tell another story uh, that's related to this theme of promises and promise making. Uh, we, were, we were driving the other day, and Becca and I have this uh, repeated uh, experience. So if you haven't spent much time talking to her, I think, I mean, this might just be dad here, but I think she's probably the most brilliant person in the world. Um, or pretty close. I think she's, she's pretty sharp. Uh, she's also one of the most stubborn people in the whole world. <laughs> uh, those two things together are a deadly force. We have had so many conversations where I say something and she says, that's not true. <laughs> or no, it's not. Or no, it's this way. And then we, <laughs> We talk and we, we kind of talk through the thing. And I can't tell you how many times she has gone, oh, and, and as she sees it, because she's super logical and will follow the, the thoughts. And she's like, well, why don't you just say that from the beginning? And I'm like, oh, and, but the conversation that we had just the other day, which was so good, I think for us, was I, I asked her, so we have this experience over and over again. What would it look like if when I just said something, you just like assumed I was right? <laughs> like, what if, you, what if you just trusted me? And she's like, why would I do that? <laughs> I, I need you to show me that you're right in that thing. 
And so I asked her this question. I said, does it matter that I'm consistently right? That, that I, I, I prove myself to be trustworthy over time. Like, would you say that that's true? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, so what if in the moment you leaned on a lifetime of, of me being pretty dependable and just assumed I was, I was right? <laughs> Where's the fun in that? <laughs> so I have a feeling we're going we're gonna to keep going at it. But there's something in this that is so true to our relationship with God. It, it speaks to the actual purpose of the scriptures. The book of Hebrews opens by talking about, by announcing God has spoken his word through the prophets. Part of this declaration is that by the time the sun shows up, God has spoken and spoken and spoken and spoken and spoke. And we can keep going, right? And spoken and spoken and spoken again and again. And has proven himself faithful to his word. When God makes promises, God keeps his promises. As you read the first testament through, this is the, the, one of the most consistent themes in the entire book text is that God is speaking things that are not only true, but he's making promises that he then keeps. And often in surprising ways, usually in surprising ways. So that as the sun appears on the scene and is living and teaching and healing and is walking among God's people, he begins to imitate his father. He makes promises. Promises like, I'm going to suffer and die and on the third day be raised again. And so he suffers and he dies just as he told his disciples he would. And on the third day, he is raised again. And the apostle Paul will ultimately end up saying, if that didn't happen, our faith is empty because we're following somebody who says that his promises are true and sure that he is a better promise maker than anyone on earth, better promise maker than I am to my daughter. This morning, I, just for fun, I was like, hey, Beck, have I ever uh, not fulfilled a promise I made to you? Without missing a beat, she said, yes, remember last summer when you said that you were going to take us to the beach that night and you didn't? She knew, like, she had the moment. And, and so in that way, she's somewhat right to, like, question whether whatever I say might be true or my promises might be, might be steady because... I'm human. I'm marked by sin. My heart is corrupted just as everyone else's. And we're reminded, the author of Hebrews reminds us once again that there is one who is better. There is one who is better than me as a father. There is one who is better than Moses as the greatest prophet of Israel. There is one who is better than all of the angels. He comes. And he fulfills God's promises, the Father's promises to us. And he makes promises of his own to us. He says stuff like, I will be with you until the end of the age. Now think about that. This morning, Pastor David invited us actually to consider that God is with us in this place and there's nothing we did to make that happen, right? We didn't like sing hard enough and then God was like, okay, cool, I'll come, right? We didn't like generate enough enthusiasm for God to show up in this space. No, no, no. Jesus promised, I will be with you until the end of the age. And so he is here with us. But there's this trust piece that, that we have to uh, come to grips with. So do I trust that Jesus is true to his promises? In this moment, he is with us here because he has been faithful to his promises from the very beginning. Can I, can I receive that truth and walk in it and live as though it's true? 
Or will I, will we treat God the way that we sometimes treat others? We go, yeah, yeah, you said that, but I need proof right now. I need proof in this moment. Otherwise, I won't obey you, God. Otherwise, I won't follow you. I won't walk with you. I need something now. The author of Hebrews is building this elaborate case that followers of Jesus, if we grow up into maturity, if we move on from milk to solid food, if we grow, that we will no longer need each momentary, God, I need proof right now to follow you, to obey you. We will come to a place. We will arrive in a place where the spirit will bring to mind, God, the one that we worship, that we follow has been faithful from the very beginning. Whatever God says, I can say yes to because God never lets us down, has not failed to keep his promises. This is part of the invitation to trust that the book of Hebrews is, is offering us. But there's one other piece that's really important. We so easily lose sight of what was actually promised. So walking that day around the block, my daughter saw something that looked fun and she mistook it for, uh, for the promise for the promised park. The author of Hebrews tells us about a land. God promises this land to a people and he brings Abraham to the land. And so Abraham's in the land that God promised, but the promise wasn't fulfilled yet. Abraham didn't have rest. He was called to live well in that land, to live in a particular way while he waited for the fullness of the promise to come. 400 plus years later, Abraham's descendants are, look like a growing fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham. They come back to that very land and they live there, but we're told, that their rest had not yet come. And so here they are in the land that God promised, but there's this sense that the fullness of God's promise had not been fulfilled. But part of what happens for them is they settle. They settle for less than all that God has. They lose sight of the full promise that God has made. This is, I think, uh, something that we have to come to grips with in our own lives and faith. We have, as, as God's people, Jew and Gentile together, been promised the earth as our inheritance. We've been given the same promise as Israel, a land, the whole earth belongs to us. But it belongs to us in a way that's not quite yet complete. We live here like Abraham lived in the land, waiting for God to complete his work, waiting for the Holy Spirit to make his bride, the bride of Jesus holy, waiting for Jesus to return for his bride, waiting for the day when all things are made new, when this earth is made new and it is perfected for our uh, <laughs> eternity with him. And so can you see these two pieces? There are these two pieces that are so central to the book of Hebrews. One is what is the actual promise? Because so often we settle for a small version of it when God has offered us so much more and calls us to wait well. But that waiting doesn't happen alone. We don't have to muscle our way through this waiting, right? We wait with the one who walks with us. And so our focus is on the true, full promise of God, and our focus is on the one who makes the promise. 
the one who walks with us. We're reminded last week that last week we looked at a couple of people who received their promise early. There is a way of living a smaller life than God intends for us, to grasp for small versions of God's promise and to, to, to satisfy ourselves, at least momentarily. But God is inviting us into more. Our God, who makes promises and who keeps promises and who still has promises to fulfill in our lives and in his creation. And so today we're called to wait. But how, how do we wait, right? Like this is, how do we do this? Well, for us, one starting place is we eat while we wait. Seriously, it, we shouldn't be surprised that, that the earliest Christians ate all the time because part of our eating together, part of how we, we share meals, including this meal, helps shape us and form us into the kind of people who can receive the fullness of God's promises. And so the goal, the work that is happening while we wait is our transformation. Something to consider. Our passage this morning, Hebrews 4, talks about the Israelites being in the land. And if you know that story, you know that part of that story was they were supposed to take swords and they were supposed to, with those swords, conquer more and more of the land. That that was part of how they were to attain their rest. But this passage in Hebrews chapter four talks about a sword as well. But that sword isn't to use on others. That sword is to penetrate our hearts. That sword is to transform us so that we can be the kind of people who can inhabit God's rest. God is at work shaping us, transforming us, making us a holy bride for his son. So what are we doing while we wait? Are we getting distracted by, by ramps or whatever shiny thing might be around us, whatever promises our culture might be offering us or anyone else, or are we drawing near to the promise maker knowing that he is at work, that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is what happens to us while we wait with him. And so let's wait and let's eat together Pastor David's going to come and lead us in a song of response. As we prepare, as we sing, I invite you to come to the table to receive the bread and the cup and return to your seats. And there uh, we'll, we'll eat and we'll drink together. But, but consider what it means for the character of Christ to, to be formed in us while we, while we wait. The gifts of God given for the people of God. Let's draw near to him today because the invitation is still open. <laughs>